So welcome you to St. John's for the afternoon for the kickoff of our Arts and Culture Series uh, 2018 season. Uh, we created the Arts and Culture Series last year to allow members of our community and beyond to share their passions and experiences with patrons and friends of the Athenaeum. It is the goal of the Athenaeum, through our staff and trustees, to continue serving as stewards of our culture and heritage and develop a greater exchange for learning and experience. We are pleased to host nine lectures this year, and a copy of the season uh, program is in your chair. So take that home and hang it on the refrigerator. Like many of the programs and events hosted at the Athenaeum, tonight's event is free, thanks to the many patrons, friends, businesses, and sponsors who donate to the Athenaeum. This support, whether through work, wealth, or wisdom, provides the crucial resources necessary to continue our mission to support lifelong learning. We encourage you to make a donation in the donation box that is located just outside the gallery door, right back there near the Bourgeois painting. In addition, if you are a registered voter for the Town of St. Johnsbury, we remain grateful for the town appropriation that you have supported and approved every year since 1920. I have included information on your seat regarding the importance of this appropriation. It provides 80% of the operating revenues needed to support valuable benefits and services, but something you may not know, the per person cost and tax revenues for the town of St. Johnsbury to support the Athenaeum is $15 Compare that to the national average for public libraries, which is $35.81, and for public libraries in the state of Vermont, which is $26.30. So you can see the tremendous value provided to the residents of St. Johnsbury for that appropriation, and we thank you for your support at town meeting. Now, on with the show. May I please ask everyone to turn off or mute your cell phones? This event is being recorded by KTV Kingdom Access Television, and I want to thank Jamie and his crew, Max, right over there, for their help. At this time, I would also like to introduce to you Bob Jolly. Is Bob here? Is he out front? Here he comes. I want to make sure everybody knows who Bob, Bob is. Many of you do know who Bob is. Um, Bob has created a small display of books, which are located at the front desk and in that area of the pool collection that shows several examples of intaglio printing. The books from the pool collection are also the original books from the, when the Athenaeum opened in 1871. In addition, Bob has assembled a really nice display of prints in a glass display case that many of you saw when you were coming in at the front of the fiction room. Bob is our curator of collections, and I want to thank Bob for his help with those displays. A little logistics this evening. As you can see, we have a lot going on here. We will begin the lecture here in the art gallery, and Bill will discuss the creative process and do a print demonstration, as you can see. And then we're all going to migrate out to the fiction room, where Bill will give, we'll talk about the prints, the plates, the process, and you're able to ask questions of Bill. It is a great honor to welcome Bill Darling to the Athenaeum this evening. As a professional artist and instructor for 30 years, Bill's work is exhibited internationally. Notable commissions and permanent collections include representing the United States in the International Collection of Shirakawa, Japan, the Art Students League of New York, Il Bisonte in Florence, Italy, and locally, many of you have seen his creation of Christ Crucified, which is the sculpture hanging above the altar at St. John's Church. He is an instructor of fine arts at St. Johnsbury Academy and is founder and co-artistic director with his wife, artist Kim Darling, who's also here this evening. Where's Kim? Here she is. Um, they also, I apologize, um, he is also an instructor of fine art and Kim of the Itaglio Society. They conduct drawing and printmaking workshops each spring in Florence, Italy. The Itaglio Society recently organized and hosted the Dia de los Muertos Festival in St. Johnsbury. He is master printer and co-owner with Kim of Gato Nero Studio, many of you have visited right down here on Eastern Avenue, and life member of the Art Students League of New York. I work with Bill and Kim at the Academy and wish to share my admiration for their artistry and dedication to the arts and our community. Please join me in welcoming Bill Powell.
Thanks very much, um, Mel, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the FNAM for having me here. This is a very inspirational environment for me. Um, more than 30 years ago, um, my, my first impression of Vermont and of St. Johnsbury, there were really two strong first impressions that I, that I remember very clearly. And the Gearstep painting is one of them. Uh, I used to marvel um, when we would come up to visit from New York, how was it possible that this could be here in such a small rural town? Um, and it's something that I try not to take for granted because, again, it's, it's, it's iconic and it's a memory for me. It's the very first impression I had of this area. And following that is my second strongest impression is um, the Woodsman Burger at Anthony's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we would come here and, uh, you know, meditate on the pain for a while and the top was going to get going. And, um, Zoom or down, down, down town for the Woodsman Burger. And we just happened in there. It was like perfect. It was like the best hamburger I've ever eaten and the most amazing <laughs> artwork. So, um, so for many years, uh, that was the ritual. This was Mecca. We would drop our paintbrushes over and stuff and drive over and, uh, and just be amazed at this painting. So uh, this is an honor. Uh, I was actually practicing proofing printing today uh, during the day, and the lighting here is magnificent. Just, uh, it's peaceful, it's calming, it's beautiful. It's, um, I just want to continue to encourage students and anyone else I've talked to to come in here and just spend some time in there because it's, um, it's more than a gallery. It's, it's a kind of an art church, really. And actually, tonight it reminds me a little bit of church. It's, um, I, I hope it's not to be so solemn as we go along and we need more workshop. But, but um, this is a very special, special place. So, um, let me get on with what I'm going to talk about. Um, my background, my, what, how I came to be um, so involved with Intaglio is kind of a strange path. Um, my training as an artist began um, a long time ago, in the 70s, um, at the Art Students League in New York City. And that's where I met Frank Mason, and um, I became completely enthralled with uh, how much he knew and what a great teacher he was. And, um, it wasn't long after that, I actually became his apprentice. And for eight years <coughs> in New York City, I got to work with him in the studio and um, help with his classes in the, at the Art Students League, and then later um, in, in Vermont in his, his summer classes. So um, my background is um, this very serious involvement with painting, and I had kind of a kind of just kind of a playful kind of few chances with Italio. Um, in college, I took a class and just just sort of played around with it, and then. That was in the back of my mind when I became more serious about painting and moved to New York. Um, so I understood as a process. Um, so I did a little printing in New York, uh, but mostly it was an extension of almost like a 15th century Xerox machine. I was thinking about reproducing my paintings um, for a different market, and it was, it was a completely, um, totally off the wall approach. It had, had nothing to do with Italian. So I found out very quickly that uh, the mediums were very distinctly um, different. Um, but what um, is the same is my, my background in painting makes my prints different. There's really two major directions in Intaglio or in uh, fine art publishing. Um, one is a more graphic venue where it's more, it's more linear, it's more uh, concerned with the construction and the cleanness of the line. Um, and then the other school, which is the painterly school, which is really messy, uh, and I love that. And uh, the, that school includes the, the great painters uh, Rembrandt and Goya and Whistler, the American expatriate in London, uh, who's, this, who's connected uh, to this press, actually, uh, which I'll talk about later. But anyway, what the painter printmakers brought to the craft was a more of a sense of mystery and more of a sense of excitement that was in tune to the mediums uh, kind of I, I call it ser serendipitous effects. I mean, you, you work on a plate and you have really no idea what's going to happen, what it will actually look like eventually. And there are all these stages where you, you move from one proof, one print to the next, and you get a hint of the direction. But mostly you get really good at problem solving. You get to understand, um, was that a good effect? Was that a good mistake? Is that a mistake that needs to alter? And so you have a kind of an intention or direction but the medium kind of takes over. So in terms of creative process, it's a very vital um, uh, medium. 
And again, uh, the painterly approach is um, I'm in search when, I, when I'm to an image, it's very important to me that the image has a sense of atmosphere of luminosity. And again, I look to Helbrecht to Europe, Germany, and, and Rembrandt to Holland, and, and Goya of Spain, just for those inspirational images that really are full of light and, uh, and light. So, so that's my direction. So at a certain point, I think about 15 years ago, I just it kind of like got the bullet, you know, whatever it is. It's um, when you when you when you put a plate into an acid to etch it, it's called biting. You bite the plate. And I learned recently from one of my students who's um, fluent in French that the acid or whatever chemical you're using to etch your plates is called a mordant. And um, any French speakers here, I'll say, um, mordant means bite. It means to bite, which is just what it is, you're biting. So when a plate is deeply bitten, it means it's etched very, very deeply, usually to the point where you can't bring it back, scrape it out, change it. So um, when I see um, a certain place in printmakers' lives where they can't stop, it's not really an obsession, but it's um, something that's very powerful. And I call it deeply bitten. So at some point, 15 years ago, I became deeply bitten. And the paintings began to fade and the intaglio became more in the forefront, uh, but carrying with it all of, all of my interests about painting. Um, so that's my background, and uh, I'm going to start stop talking soon, which is a really relief for you as well as for me. Um, this is meant to be more of a demonstration than a lecture, and the first part of the demonstration, as Mel mentioned, I'm going to ink and, and proof a plate. It's very dark. And the plate's quite small, so I'll do the best I can to stop every once in a while and, uh, and show you the progression of the plate. But what I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through the printing process, and then when the print's ready, I'll ask everyone to come up and I'll, I'll pull the print back and you can see actually the effect. Now, this is a bit of a cart before the horse. You're going to see an edge and Italian print uh, printed, but uh, the terms I use and the process I go through is, is going to be unfamiliar, and you'll have a lot of questions. So. That will lead to part two of the workshop or the demonstration. Uh, as Mel mentioned, we'll go out in the entrance of the library. And there I'd like it to be more of a question and answer. Like if you see an image or a plate, uh, feel, feel free to come and ask me what it is. And, and the second part of it will be just a kind of more informal question and answer. Um, when, when you look at the plates, uh, I'm going to pass the plate around in a minute. Uh, I really encourage you to touch the plate, to feel the lines, because a lot of times with printmaking, with intaglio plates, it's, it's so much about the metal. You can feel what's going on better than you can see it. So it's really important to touch that. And with the prints, because those are finished prints, uh, don't feel those. <laughs> those don't touch those. Um, um, those are just meant to be seen. But definitely the plates, feel free to, uh, to really to, to handle them. And again, I'll pass one around, uh, which is pretty sturdy. Nothing could happen to it. So, um, so anyway, um, brief history, very brief history. Um, it's brief, especially because in the internet age, you can find so much about anything. Um, I don't want to bore you with the history of blow by blow of printmaking, but I can recommend a, a website that's excellent, Crown Point Press in San Francisco, which I've had the um, privilege to work at for two summers um, with the founder of. Uh, uh, Ms. Brown, uh, so that was really phenomenal. But their website is amazing, both for technical information and also for aesthetic uh, conversations. She has a, something she highlights in her talk called Three Minute Egg, and it's just a three minute talk about something about printmaking or about uh, creative process. Um, so basically, this the beginning of um, printmaking is in the 15th century, and, and a lot of the the work is believed to be coming from Florence, Italy, where we go every year. And um, the, actually, the word Italia is a northern Italian word um, for lime or incised lime. So it's a lime that's going into the plate. Um, so because of all the goldsmith and all the, the world renowned uh, silversmith and, and sword makers and armament makers that relied on carving their images into metal and etching their images into metal, um, the process was already halfway there. Um, so these metal workers would, they would chisel a piece of gold or they would um, etch an iron, um, you know, sword or an iron um, breastplate or something. And they would put wax over it and etch through the metal. 
but then they wanted to, a way to preserve a record of what they had done to show future clients um, to use again in another design. Um, so what they did was they rubbed ink into the carvings and then took a dampened piece of rag paper and pressed it into it and rubbed it, burnished it, and pulled it back. And that was really the, the beginning of Italia. Um, very soon after that, um, artists seized on that idea as, a, as an image making process. And soon after that, machines like this were being built. Um, this is a 19th century press. Um, I've got a, a one that was designed especially for Batonero that was just built five years ago. And the only difference in that, besides it being like two tons, um, is the gear ratio. It's much easier to move the press through the rollers. So the way it works is the, um, there are two rollers, a top roller and a bottom roller, and the bed passes through it when you turn it. In the 15th century, this wheel was a direct drive. The wheel would go right to the, to the roller, and it took two or three men to turn the wheel um, under tremendous pressure. And usually they were made out of wood, so they were not as, as durable. Um, so this is essentially the same process. Um, this particular one is cast iron. Today, presses are typically made out of steel or laminates or um, all kinds of all kinds of material. Um, but anyway, the nature of the process is very very much the same. Um, so anyway, I just briefly want to talk about the categories of fine art printmaking. Now, there's three three really major categories. Uh, the first one is relief, and that's woodblock or a letterpress, or if any of you have ever done potato prints at Christmas time, where you carve a potato, make Christmas cards with that. Um, that's where the ink touches the printed printing surface, and that's out in the beef, stands out in the beef. So in Italia, the next form goes in, because it's a line that goes in. So the ink line is recessed. And later I'm gonna um, show you some uh, prints that are just printed without ink, so you can actually see the lines that are just the embossed paper go through that. So, um, and also there's a contradiction in this definition. The plate that I pass around is made as a relief print as well as an Italian print. So you'll be able to see that. And the third one is clinographic. And that's <clears throat> something where the image is, is made on the surface and it doesn't go into the plate, it doesn't rise above the plate. It's just on the plane of the surface of the, the printing matrix. Typically a lithography would be a stone or a piece of metal. Um, also, I, I have a planographic print on display out there. It's called a monotype. And that's where you make a painting on a single sheet of, of plastic or, or copper. And then you run it through the press. And monoprint means you just get one, just one image. Um, but that's a planographic process as, a, as well. So this plate that I'm going to pass around, um, also um, out, out in the foyer is um, I have this printed like six or seven different ways, as a relief print, as a multi-color viscosity print, as a chinquille, as a black and white. So there, you can see like how many processes there are just in a single plate. Um, so I'm gonna pass this around, and this is definitely a rubber. I mean, it's like, this is the sound of finger makes, whatever, but just fun. This is one of the most deeply written plates that I've made, so this is a good example of Italia plus relief. And the light is very poor here, but um, later on we'll get outside. Can you guys see that shadow of the lines? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the towel. I mean, that's that's what's why this is not chronographic. Um, this is not just a simple surface. This is a, a top of map. So um, when I pass this around, it's going to be more. You're not going to be able to see it, but you possibly going to be able to feel the main lines on that. So. So um, I'm going to go on uh, with the V plate, just a very quick description of the origin of the plate. Um, this plate um, is fairly typical in terms of the process when I'm in Italy. I've gone um, less than two weeks to get a lot of work done. And um, I try not to waste a lot of time, but at the same time, I like plates to happen or to evolve. Because if I force my, my um, timetable on my prints, that's what they look like. They look too mechanical. So really what I like is kind of an unfolding of how an image uh, happens. So um, there's a restaurant um, Kim and I go to every year. It's called I Itarochi, is that what you say? Itarochi. Itarochi, thank you. Itarochi means tarot card. 
And um, we got to know the owner, and, and she happens to be a beekeeper. And every year when we go there, um, she brings us fresh honey from her hives and serves it on a platter with all these great regional cheeses. Has anybody ever eaten honey with cheese? It's, it's amazing. But a very sharp cheese, and uh, I you say salty and sharp, what do you think the cheeses are? Yeah, yeah and the honey, the contrast, the sweetness is great. So anyway, that's, that's a real treat when we go there. So I'm thinking B, when I'm going there, I'm thinking B. And um, also, last year, the third proctor on the trip was the librarian from the academy, uh, Linda Worcester, who also was a beekeeper. So I just had all this kind of like motivation to like create some kind of a bee image. Um, I also wanted to, I've never drawn anything under magnification, and I wanted to try that, so I bought this headset that has uh, 10x um, lenses on it, so I could see everything 10 times. So this bee print, it looks like a giant bee, but um, <laughs> I, I'm so used to looking at it, I think, wow, I don't want to get bitten by this bee, it's a bee. <laughs> but actually the bee itself um, was, was quite small. And um, I found it in, uh, there's a museum we draw in there every year in Florence uh, called La Specola. La Specola? Yeah, La Specola. La Specola. <laughs> it's like a giant Fairbanks museum. La Specola means uh, observatory. So there's a huge observatory. There's um, acres and acres of animals and plants and uh, fish. It's amazing. Human anatomy is quite incredible. So, I knew there'd be a bee there. There must be a bee in this place. So I, I searched everywhere and I found an Italian bee. And um, later on, Linda Worcester told me, she said, she said, oh, that's an Italian bee. And I said, well, do you know your bees? And she said, yeah, Italian bees are beautiful. They're very docile and happy. They don't bite you. They're really friendly. Um, <laughs> you know? It's like everybody's like that in Italy. So even the bees, you know. And she said, not my bees. She said, my bees are Russian. And, um, you can imagine. Um, they're dark, they're small, and they're mean. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Anyway, so um, I found a, a, a bee, and it was in this case, and I basically set up shop there. I just put all my plates out, my tools out, my sketchbook out, put my headgear on, pressed my face into the window, <laughs> and just started drawing. And, and fortunately, it was, it was mostly empty on those days in the museum, so nobody bothered me. But, Occasionally, I would get some strange looks, but it doesn't matter when you're in Italy, it doesn't matter when you're, you're a stranger. So, so anyway, I drew the bee, and um, this I'm drawing here, is, and you'll see it from back there. So I, I took the drawing back to the studio, and I drew, no, actually I drew the bee at the museum, and I took the plate back to the studio to bite the plate, to etch the plate, and um, the very first proof is um, this one which I was pretty excited about because um, I like the image. Uh, mm -hmm. But then that wore off and I really I wanted to see something more. It wore off quite quickly, like in about an hour. Um, so I thought, well, this one I actually tried a soft ground too, and I'll explain more about soft ground later. Uh, soft ground worked, but it failed. You can see like a light kind of impression here. But when you look at these closer, uh, what worked with that second soft ground is this really light veining in the wings that came out really nicely. So I did gain something. I was very frustrated with the back of the So um, the back of the plate, I wanted a richer tonality. This one um, has soft ground with aqua tint, so you can begin to see more contrast in the vein. And you can see a little bit more of tonality in the fabric. And this is actually printed chin filet. Um, when I go to Il Zante to print, they're like the only place besides the back and has a special Bible paper. And it's, um, you know, like a Bible paper is so thin and you can't see through it to the other side of the text. So it has an opacity to it, but it's very, very, very thin. And it's this creamy gold color. So that, I printed it with that paper, um, Chinkolet. And again, I'll, I'll explain Chinkolet later. And that came out and I was happy for about 10 minutes. And then I decided, no, I need more. And so I went home and uh, I bought some flowers from a street vendor. And they wrapped it in this yellow netting, this bright yellow cubed kind of shaped netting. I had never seen that before. It wasn't paper, it wasn't cellophane, it was this, this strange netting. And I instantly realized that's my that's my B print, that's my background. So um, I did something called soft ground. And that's when I got something that I liked. So this would be called, this would be artist proof. This is the point in time where I'm satisfied or I'm not satisfied, I'm very pleased. 
with the image, and this can go into an addition. So you can see very clearly now this, these fabric marks. These are not made with drawing lines. They're made with the fabric from the flowers. And um, it's not random. It's somewhat random, somewhat arbitrary. But this tear and the arrangement of the pattern, um, I worked really hard to, to have that in drawing. So more or less I was drawing with the fabric, not so much the needle. Um, but it carries the effect of, of, of a linear kind of approach. So anyway, that's what I'm going to print now. Um, so you want to you want to put that top light on again so you get a little more light on yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, this is where. Um, I ink the plates. Um, it's a copper table, and it has a heating element underneath it. And that's important because it slightly warms the, the plate, and that helps the ink in terms of wiping it and in terms of releasing the ink. And in February, it feels like really good to have your hands here. So all those things combined, it's very good. So I'm going to let this plate warm up. And I'm going to get some ink ready over here. So this is, um, I tried printing that in all different inks, all different papers, and I finally um, settled on this ink um, called Sanguina, or in Italian, I'm sorry, louder, yes, Sanguina, Sanguina. And I chose the Sanguina because um, it looked like honey, you know, it looked like it gave the feeling of honey. So um, this is an earlier test plate of, you mix the Sanguina, with a transparent base so you can make it as transparent and thin or as opaque as you like. And then um, this is from a previous printing and this is from this afternoon. You, maybe you can see this. This is pure sanguine and this is some of the transparent base and that's a little bit more and that's just enough where if you look closely at this, the reason this works is because it has a sense of like refraction, like atmosphere. Okay, everyone is signaling to me to say louder. Okay, sorry. Is the mic on here? The mic's up, yeah. So anyway, the ink knife, the Sanguina ink, and um, I'm just going to warm the ink up a little bit. Um, just the friction helps it to um, get to the consistency that I'm looking for. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, so this is an inking card. I'm just going to just scrape a bead of ink onto the card like that. And the next part of this is um, I need to force the ink down into the lines. And at the same time, I want to maintain the surface tone um, simultaneously. So right, this first bit is I'm just pressing the ink from different directions so I don't miss any of the lines because if I miss a line when it goes through the press the paper will be pressed into that line and if there's no ink there it will just print as a white line so occasionally you'll see that in etchings that there'll be like a white area that's um, where it was white too hard or inked too little so you can see why uh, this is part of the value, aside from the quality, uh, um, a hand-published print. This is a quite a, an amazing process. So um, if you see a print and it says $300 on it, or $900, or $1,500, there's a real reason behind that. Uh, aside from the inherent quality, the process is, is really uh, highly demanding. 
technology at the moment. So, and we're, we're used to, with the digital, the imagery is so fast and so immediate, and so um, they're not, it's not an association with this kind of quality image. So. It's like poetry. It's like it has a sense of poetry about it. It's um, visual poetry. And I'm sorry, you can't see this. Um, Hold it up. and see the movie. Okay. Can you see the image at all? Yes. Okay. So right now I have um, ink in the lines and have ink on the surface. And I'm going to remove the, uh, the top layer in a very even manner, so it's just an even tone across the whole plate. And then I'm going to selectively wipe it in different areas so to change the light effect. And then again, that's part of the painterly approach to printmaking. And there's definitely a school of printmaking that thinks that's a horrible thing to do. Um, but to me as an artist, I don't, I don't see why I should go part way there and want to have this other octave that I can be working on. So um, to me, it makes really perfect sense to push it. to um, we call wipe the plate. This is a piece of cheesecloth that's been soaked in starch, so it's stiff. If it didn't have the starch in it, it would press into the lines and take the ink out too quickly. So this is stiff enough and I keep attention on the cloth so it doesn't do that. So my first action is just going to be to create like an even tone across everything. I'm just kind of smearing it. And this is really sticky, it's like honey. So you can see now that it's, um, it's fairly even. Going across. Okay. So now uh, this has got enough ink on it. I want to start over with a, uh, a cleaner, softer piece of tarlatan. And now I'm going to go more for a selection um, of values, of higher values, and so on. So the more you rub this, the brighter it gets. The less ink it has, the, the, the uh, higher value. Okay, so um, you can see that I made the area behind the netting a little bit lighter, and I made the wings a little bit lighter. So it's important that the wings are a little bit lighter so you can see that vein, that's the delicate vein in the wings. I want to take just a little bit more general light out and use a piece of tissue paper. It's such an abrupt change in contrast that um, typically what I'll, I'll do something like this and then I'll go over it again and this will bring, bring back a sense of harmony or pull it back together again. Okay. So clean the edge a little bit. This is alcohol.
So I'm going to wipe the edge um, because this is going to deeply emboss into the paper and I've sculpted the edge to be round and um, make an interesting uh, border. So I don't want any ink on it. I want it to be as clean as I can make it. And this is, um, this is an example, you know, for me, this is a very well crafted plate. And what I mean by that is it's crafted so it's easy to print. Um, all, a lot of the technical issues are, are um, more simple because of the craft of how the plate's constructed. Like I'm looking at this border, it's got a chamfer on, it's got a little small panel on the front of it. Um, it's really easy to wipe the plate um, because of that. Okay, so now um, I'm going to take a bit of this. This is just um, chalk, and I'm going to put some on my apron here, like this. And I'm going to put it on my hand. So that's going to just put like a film of powder, in, and it's going to be able to enable me to wipe the plate across without. Um, taking too much ink up or leaving any oil from my hand. So I'm just going to just lightly push it across. Okay, and then lastly, um, I'm going to put a little powder on that edge. powder will inhibit the, um, the ink, so we'll keep that edge nice and clean. Um, Kathleen Brown of Crown Point Press. Um, she's been a, a world-class printmaker since, um, I think since the 1960s. She was one of the very first um, really large etching publishers, and um, she's very cute when she describes how to, how to wipe the plates. She calls this tickling, so she'll go up to the plate and she goes, tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> this is this great master printer, like the, one of the greatest historical printmakers in American art. She's like, Tickle, tickle, tickle. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, really hilarious. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave that. I have some paper damp pads. This is 100% rag paper. It's soaked overnight. So it's about as pliant as, um, like, what is it? It's the dough, the phyllo dough. It's like phyllo dough. It's like very, very, very kind of it could fall apart. So uh, soft, but it's really um, it's soft, so it can get pressed into those lines. So um, I was printing with oil base ink, and I have a paper that's um, saturated with kind of water. So if I have any surface water on that, it's going to repel the oil and ink. So what I want to do is just gently blot it. And just give it that surface water. So can you see how it's shiny? That's you have to get rid of that.
So I have um, a registration guide on the press, so I know exactly where the plate goes and where the paper goes. And in this press, they didn't design stops for the bed. And it's a little bit spooky because if I keep turning this, 100 pound piece of steel and it crashes on the floor. So um, you have to watch it. Most, most presses have these intelligent stops on them, so they didn't do that. So this adds to the excitement of well, watching the bed. All right, so I'm going to catch the paper under the roller. <laughs> I haven't used this in a little while. <laughs> Bill, your microphone fell on the ground. Oh, thank We're you very much. Okay. What? <laughs> <Here. Come on. laughs> So the plates. So um, this is I think this is the first image I've ever made moving away from like 15 years doing a place like this. I just decided to do this. And um, when I did that, it really looked like sign. Like look at me. So I thought that's a good quality. We'll go with that. And also I printed it all all these different ways, and each one looks really, really very different. And, I finally decided that this is the way it will go, and I've marked it on the top because it's really, really easy to um, put it at a different angle. Okay. So as the plate um, is going under the roller, you feel a lot more pressure. There's enough pressure from the press that there was a piece of scotch tape on the back of the plate. It would have lost all the way to the front of the plate and pick up the relief of the, the piece of tape. So it's a lot of pressure. This is the point if you want to stretch your legs and come up. Um, I can show you the print. I hope I can show you the print. So the plate that I passed around has very, very deep, deep, deep embossment. Um, this is more typical of, of, of many etchings where it's, the lines are not that pronounced, they're much more subtle. But you can see how this was, you know, put away here and created that um, involvement in the paper. That's what really a, a whole lot of the charm of this uh, the image. I'm going to hold this back and hear it down there. And I'll put this up front too so you can take a look at it. It's a little dark. So does anybody have any immediate questions that I can answer this for this, from this process, by this process? Okay. Yeah, the paper, what I did was, um, this is reverse. I catch the paper under the roller so it stays in one place and can't move and peel it back. And the plate is put on the face up. And the reason, you can also, like the way we would print at school, 
you just place the paper down like that and push it. Um, but if you, if you roll it back and it just encounters the paper a little bit at a time, there's less stretch. Uh, it, it's possible if you just put the paper down and actually stretch the paper a little tiny bit and get some distortion. So this, this is really a way to eliminate that stretch, or at least to reduce it. Um, depending on on the ink, some inks dry faster than others. Um, yeah, you really have plenty of time. I've never really had a problem with um, something drawn on the paper, unless I've ever left it to get open paper or something like that. Five or six hours, which I never do. But you could there is places where you can get some really good ink. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, there are some places that are outside, like the California print that's the colorful sense of the other trees. That's two plates, and that has to be, you print the color plate first, and then while the ink is still wet and the paper is still wet, you put the matrix of the tree you're on and another plate on top and run it back to the other way. So you're dependent on those colors fusing and getting wet. Um, so if I were using colors that were more of a cicative, more of a dryer, like a burnt umber is highly cicative. Even bird lumber would take a while, but, but typically you have you know, an hour or a half. So, but in the case of the multiple plate, and there's a few, there's at least two examples of multiple plate out in, in the lobby that um, I can talk about that too. And that, that's really interesting because you can start superimposing like layers and has an increased sense of, of depth and, you know, and color and change color and so on. Yeah, it's actually I've done this an edition of this on this edition. I think it's it's either ninety or ninety nine. Could, could you at this point run another piece? No, no, I, 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 I could. I could, and it would be called a ghost print. So, for example, if I wanted to do a pastel on this, I could run it through and do a ghosted image of the design, and I could work on top of it in another medium. So that would be a ghost. Um, they got into that a lot. They got into tons and tons of uh, ghosted prints and. Many of his pastels are reworks of his monoprints and his possessions. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool thing to do. It's a watercolor thing. Mm -hmm. so. Is that dry now? Or is it no, this, uh, the paper, what has to happen next is you put this uh, between uh, acid free tissue paper and then you put a, a panel of wood on either side and you weight it. And then every day or two days you change the paper so you can get the mold. And that, well, it don't dry flat, otherwise, it'll dry wrinkled. And the ink itself, um, a week to two weeks, it takes a while for it to drop. Yes? And what was that Blake? Because I know, what, what, were his ghosts done? Blake. Because his wife, I know, did the, yeah, the coloring. Yeah, the coloring. Yeah. There's a really, really good story um, with Blake. Blake, um, because he provided text with his images, yeah. he had text right into his um, plates. Yeah. And um, he wrote, um, that he had a vision that his dead brother taught him how to do that process. Like nobody was doing lettering like that up to that point. And I forget what it was, it was some kind of a, it was kind of a, a was something called sugar lift, I think it's a kind of form of sugar lift, but actually nobody was doing it. And he claimed his brother, it was a big problem because, you know, he's publishing these beautiful poems and prints and he wanted them to be together and he couldn't afford a letterpress person. He had to do everything himself and he and his wife would spend all night long hand coloring these things. It was like a huge labor process. Um, but that so, was not a ghost. No, that was the original. Those are the originals mm -hmm. that hand colored. But the text is, um, I think it's fascinating. You know, whether it was his brother or not, he, that came to him in a dream. So, so yes. you, you mentioned that it was a well-crafted place. Yes, yes. What did you mean by that? I'm very proud of the level of craft that, that I've achieved. For example, when I first Kim can attest that because Kim used to print my plates. I mean she still helps me a lot and prints a better printer than I am, more patient. But it used to take like four or five hours for me to print a plate because it was so dependent on the plate tone for the effect and so dependent on the ink for the qualities. And it was so poorly made you couldn't get it to catch the ink. Um, so since that time, uh, my daughter Florence is a really incredible printmaker. And, um, She's still kind of at the stage where her prints are not quite hitting that. And she always says, she always remarks about that. She always gets angry. Not angry, but just like, 
how do you get that crowd? I'm not bragging, it's just like, it's just these things that you learn along the way that have nothing to do with the quality of the print or the aesthetic of the print, but if it's so difficult to publish it, you'll never, you'll never get it done, or it'll be miserable as you work. So, the examples of what, what I mean by that, um, this plate, um, and this is what I teach um, my students, um, Jeff is learning this, and they're making one, is, um, there's something called stop out, and that's everything is about, and etching is about resist. So a resistance to the chemical action of the, of the mortar. So this has a very fine line that's stopped out before the plate was bitten. So um, you can buy these oil paint markers now, and you can just hold it by the edge of your finger and just go like that and draw an even bead of paint all the way around. And then you flip it over and do the same thing on the back. This is the original backing that you don't need to take off, but you put a backing on a shelf paper on this so it protects the back from the acid. And then you trim that edge and stop that out so that doesn't get affected by the edge. And also, um, you don't get any leakage of the mordant underneath this piece of paper. So um, that's, that's the most obvious thing about this plate. And I guess the depth of the lines is appropriate to the effect. Um, the, the netting is more aggressively deeper bitten because it needs to be to hold that value. And um, the opposite is true of the veining in the, in the wings. I just need to have very, very subtle marks. So um, it's kind of a, a craft language at a certain point. And the plate is, is heavy, you know, it's, um, it's a 24 gauge, so it's, um, when you work on it, it's, you're really working a piece of metal. And, and that brings me to, um, I, I, I hadn't thought about this before, but um, Intaglia was born of jewelry. And, and many of my students are, are have been are currently double majoring in, in printmaking and jewelry. And my, my daughter has begun to take a, a jeweler's saw to her etchings and start cutting them out and making them into either embossed prints or making them into um, sculptural type things. Um, Caleb Kultis, who just recently graduated from Academy three years ago, he's a student at Rhode School of Design. He's in Estonia right now studying medieval uh, jewelry making, uh, forging, casting, enameling. Uh, myself, um, at this point, I have a greater fascination with what I can do to a piece of metal. Like if I just, when I, I just I look at a piece of bare copper and then think about it and do this to it, you know, it really becomes about the metal more than about the image. So the image is important, obviously, and that's what we're working for. But in terms of um, the interest in the craft and the kind of fascination with uh, the metal work, it's really still completely in jewelry making and that kind of craft. So. I'm curious about how you get the lines on the copper. They're so fine. Well, that's that's because the car is here and the horse is out there. So ah, um, okay. I have a, I have a plate that has a wax crown on it's called hard ground. I have some needles that you can draw through, and I can explain that process okay. at once. And I have a blank plate for engraving. Just time to start. Time to go. Okay, so let's move out and down. I can show you. That's fine. Thank you very much. This makes a single dotted line. And this is how I made the, the marks on, uh, there's a fish print here, a big tall fish. So it's okay. it's yeah. over there. I made all the little um, marks on the fish with this tool just by drawing with it like that. Makes a cool sound. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these, I invite everybody to do that. And this is a hard round, it's the same pop of plate. But this, I'm getting my lines by mechanical force through pressure. This, all of the variations in lines, you can see these are test plates for hard ground, it has to do with the exposure to the mordant. So well, what you can do is, I, I like to use different thicknesses of needles to draw through. So this is like um, a consistent line here. So you just, I always think this is like ice skating. Like when, I, when I grew up on the lake and I used to ice skate, um, I, do we get black ice in Vermont? We usually get snow on ice, so you don't ever see it. But where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of snow, but you get this ice, and the first six inches of it was black, just completely black, like marble, and smooth. So when you skated on it, it was just like, you could just feel it cut into the black. So it's exactly the same drawing through this. This is like black ice, and it just it has that quality, that feel. And because it's so subtle, you're just drawing through this very, very thin layer of wax. 
it actually picks up a heartbeat. I mean, any kind of sensation or movement in your body, it, it registers. It's like a seismograph. Um, so uh, these are all these different um, mark making tools um, in my kit. These are burnishing tools. These are meant to like take lines out so you can actually rub across them and it flattens them out so they don't receive the ink. So you can actually create the lines and move them and take them out. Um, these, these are test plates. And this is called soft ground. And if you can see the cheese printer, take a look at it later, that's a soft ground. And what that is is um, I put a wax coating on like this, but it's a wax that's softer. It has sheep's towel in, so it's like greasy. Then I put a piece of uh, Japanese rice paper on top of it, and I draw on top of it with a pencil. And you can see it's very, very faint, but it picks, you go like this, it picks up the wax wherever there was pressure from the pencil. Then you bite that plate and it has that effect. So that's soft ground in drawing. And you saw that soft ground in the bead and the net. That's another way of doing it. That's this process where you can take fabric, or in this one there's fabric and there's a feather, there's a feather in there. And I, this test plate is for all of these fabrics. Oh, cool. This, um, this is the way you can incorporate soft ground right into your image. You see the burlap? Pattern in that. So that's hard ground and soft ground together. So typically, I, I use mixed technique. I use like multiple techniques on a single image. And this was done um, outdoors. Um, actually, I finished this plate. It, it's three or four different places, and it's three or four different drawings and paintings. And I finally finished it um, in front of the academy. You know, the apple trees in front of the, the academy. That's what these are. So, um, but then I did the massing and the, the tones with. Um, with uh, burlap, and Mel noticed this the other day. That, can you see this kind of subtle variation here in the sky? Mm -hmm. um, that's called that's the serendipitous part. Um, when I had the wax ground on there, a piece of newsprint fell on it and uh -huh. stuck to the plate. And to my horror, when I lifted it up, it lifted the ground up. Which I, I've worked on this plate for four years. This is like a major, major effort. Um, and when it did that, I was like. I don't think that's so serendipitous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was so frustrated, I just bit it anyway. I threw it in there, and um, it made this really soft cloud. <laughs> so the plate knew what it needed. So. See, when you do the, the hard ground, you actually put the wax on yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you remove it and do a soft ground. And you do separate processes. Exactly. That's a good question. Sections of it as you do it. You have to you have to remove each layer. Like typically, what you'll do is. You'll put the ground on, you'll draw through it, you'll bite it, then you take the ground off and you print it, because that's the only way you can actually see what you've done is by printing it. Then you print it and say, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. You put another ground on and re redraw it again. It's working little sections. You yeah, well, I, I work on everything all at the same time, so I, I tend to do it in layers, like the whole image at a time. Um, but then you can start to mix the techniques, like as in this one. It started as a hard ground etching, and it ended up as being uh, engraving, mesotint, and um, soft ground. Um, so engraving and mesotint are, are the mechanical tools process. This is a mesotint rocker. You go like this, and it, it makes like a, a series of dots, and that picks up the ink. So um, that's a whole other technique. This is a really, really difficult technique. Um, so anyway, these test plates, this, this is a hard ground test plate showing the exposures and the same pattern and what it looks like for the greater depth of line. This is a test plate for aqua tint, and that's a tonal process, like this black here is an aqua tint, that tone, and that's achieved by... Tell them what the numbers mean. Oh, the numbers are, is time. This is like 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minute, four minute. Time in the... Time in the morning. So what I do, for example, I'll, I'll have the plate and this is the plate. And I aqua tint it with a rosin. And um, I, I drew with a paint pen the numbers first, and then I aqua tinted it. Then I put the entire plate in for 15 seconds. Take it out, and then stop out the 15 seconds. So that will be forever 15 seconds. So the rest of the plate is still 15 seconds. I drop it in for another 15 seconds, and the whole plate becomes 30 seconds. Stop that out, and so on. So that's called step bath. That's uh, where you get a progression of values. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, but this is uh, really the most straightforward aquatint method. Do you make your own mordant, or is it uh, they all equivalent? I, I mix my own mordant, but it's pretty consistent. Um, what I use is called ferric chloride, and um, it's combined ferric chloride, with, which is an iron salt, 
and it's at 45 baum, and that means baum is a, a way of measuring density of liquid, and 45 baum is just before ferric chloride turns into a solid, so it's really, really thick. And um, there's really a brilliant printmaker in Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland, and in the, I think the late 80s, he discovered how to correct a really major problem with ferric chloride. Ferric chloride has been used since the 1500s, but has a problem with um, when you bite the plate in a tray, it creates a precipitate um, as it reacts, and it slowly fills in the lines and actually stops out the lines. So you, the longer you bite something, it actually gets lighter. Um, I've had that happen. It's really weird. Um, but he figured out chemically, if you added uh, citric acid to the ferric chloride in a certain proportion, it eats up the precipitate, so it's like perfect. You can use it um, just like you would use hydrochloric acid. So that's a mordant that I would mix. The only thing I mix is I get the liquid ferric chloride pre-mixed. I mix it from granular, but it's dangerous because it gives off a lot of fumes and heat. Um, so I'll get a liquid ferric chloride and I'll add powdered um, citric acid to that. And then you have to um, jump start the, the mordant by dropping a piece of copper into it to start the etching. So um, it won't be so irregular and harsh. It kind of middle, creates a middle kind of um, reaction instead of a high contrast reaction. So I somewhat make them. And then, of course, let me get the print on here. This one, uh, this is uh, one that I did really make really carefully. This is an aquatint hard ground and spit bite. And spit bite is you take pure nitric acid and you create different dilutions of it. Um, and it's really fun because you, um, you can't control it in any way. They call it spit bite because if you spit like around the area the acid is, it, it keeps it from creeping into the other areas of the plate. So you're like you're spitting on your plate and you're rubbing it. <laughs> and little green smoke is like <laughs> coming off the plate. And your brush is being like pared away and eaten. So if you use it full strength, it does that. But this has um, many dilutions. So I had like six dilutions before I started painting on this. So it makes this really beautiful watercolory kind of ink wash, smoky. Um, that's called spit bite. So that's something that I really definitely uh, make before I work. Um, so then, this, did I talk about the soft ground? <laughs> so soft ground is this with fabric, and it's this with drawing. And these are test plates from some soft ground. And then just quickly, aquatin is um, pine rosin, but it's, it's in a box. And there's a fan in the bottom of the box, and you turn it on, and it creates a dust storm inside the box. And um, if there's any kind of electric spark, ignition, or cigarette anywhere near, it's just like being near a grain elevator when they explode. It's very bad. So um, when we go to when we go to Italy, everything is very informal. And uh, should I say this? <laughs> so, so we have a, like this big, you know, it's like a an outdoor patio where you hang out and eat your lunch and work on your plates. And that's where you bite the plates because you're out in the open air. And then there's an aqua tint box, it's just kind of under a ledge, like this overhang here. And master printer, uh, Vincenzo Berluzzi, smokes. He's a chain smoker. Oh. And um, he's like, he always has a cigarette like this and the ash hanging off the end. And he opens the aqua tint door and the smoke, the <laughs> dust. Oh my God. He's like, just looking at it. <laughs> and everybody else is like, <laughs> I said, no, it's like, Bomba, so, uh, so anyway, it's a dust storm in a box, and you open this little door and you slide the plate and close it, and then you time it, and you have to learn what the appropriate time is for the density of the, the rosin. And you're looking for 50, 50 rosin and copper, so little dots of dust and little open spaces between the dots. Then you carefully take it out and you heat it, and that's a, that's very challenging to heat. You can see like some kind of heat problem in this, but. Uh, it melts the rosin and it makes these really, you know, rigorous little pieces of like uh, glued on dots to the plate that resist the mordant. So when I bite that plate, this plate was bitten for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour because I just wanted a black tone, a dark tone. Um, so all of the spaces in between the dots get bitten or eaten away or etched. And the place that has little melted dots of rosin are the spaces in between the etch. Um, still catch the surface, so um, it's a very, very delicate process. And so there's this many ways. Hidden surface. Or What's it? Black. You said. What's this that? This is the surface. Right yeah, yeah, you can feel it. See how it's kind of like a pebbly. Yeah. Okay. okay. This is a great story, and we're almost out of time, right? Are you okay? All right. Um, this started. This is a student at the academy. <laughs> about she actually she graduated last year, but this was as a freshman. 
she bravely posed as a Medusa. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a really hard pose, obviously. And so we did this drawing. Actually, it's Julia. So, um, um, so I was kicking around in my sketchbook for a really long time. I wanted to do a Medusa for a really long time. And then when we went to Italy, um, this one particular year, we worked with a different three realtor years three years ago. And um, she was a demon. She was horrible. She was mean and uh, it was a nasty. Landlady. She was our landlady. She was our landlady. So when I got home, um, I worked improvisationally from my memory of her visage and, and this. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. so it's called the Medusa of Vespucci 9. So one day I'm going to nail it on the door and just <laughs> I'm sure she gets a hint on it. But anyway, that's my revenge for all the torments. So. Copper, yes. the only medium? No, no. Um, okay. Copper is the best medium. It's the greatest medium. Um, yeah. More frequently, um, people use zinc. That's much more popular. And you may be noticing these. these. Yes, oh, good nice. question. This is great. Um, this is um, this is the print of the fish that's right back there, and that's that's the technical gymnastics. Um, that's shin clay, double plate, soft ground, aquatint, spit plate. <laughs> And it's really crazy. It's crazy to do. So um, this one, um, it's, this is the drawing. My son Simon, um, for Father's Day, said, what do you want? I said, I want a rockfish. So he went out and bought me a rockfish. And I drew it um, in my daughter's backyard. And then we took it in the kitchen. And they called my son, who was, I don't know, Tahiti or something, the sailor. He said, what do we do with this fish? How do we cook it? So the three of them were on the phone. They cooked the fish, and then we ate it. Okay. So the next day, I brought this back to Crown Point, and um, I wanted to do something. So I wanted to make a double plate, um, and I wanted it to be the co I love the color of rockfish. They're that really beautiful orange. And unfortunately, I pushed it as hard as I could. I couldn't get that effect. But it ended up working very nicely on uh, shin clay. That's a Japanese uh, uh, top cut. Gampi. It's a gampi paper from Japan. But anyway, how this works is um, this is a soft ground, like the cheese print. Soft ground and uh, Japanese rice paper on the top. And then I just hand drew, like I free drew from, from that drawing. And this, this is my I threw that in there as I was drawing. And uh, <laughs> yes, it has to food kind of ball or something. So anyway, so I did that one. And then I printed it on a sheet of paper, and then I, I think I offset and printed it on the plate so I had like the shape. And then this is um, this is an aqua tint soft ground spit light on, on the second plate. Yeah. So if you can see the print, this kind of tone you see here is the color, is the body of, of the ink. So um, this was printed first, and what's really difficult about it is you have to get the registration of the plates perfect. And I mean perfect, like this little edge of the lip and the tail and all that stuff, it has to do the same thing there. So it's like a million to one. So why doesn't it look like copper? Oh, yes. Um, actually, I have a glossary of terms. Um, you're free to, feel free to take them home with you. So if you, if you want to think about what do you mean by dry point or SHOK. Why doesn't that plate look like copper? Okay. So anyway, before we get to that, um, okay. <laughs> just want to say that this one was printed first. And then this print is second on top of the wet plate, and it was perfectly registered. And at the same time, it did a shin so that means this, the first one had a sheet of um, Japanese paper with glue size that was printed out. So one more level of complexity. Um, so Kim's point about why does it look shiny like silvery, um, this is a fragile ground, and, I'm, I, and also color is really reactive to, to copper. Like if I use yellow on copper, like this kind of yellow, this was a steel face plate. Um, it would come out as a green because it instantly would react with the copper. Mm -hmm. So this is a steel facing process where this is dipped into a, a, a tank that's a solution of, of iron. Actually, it's not steel, it's iron powder. And it's positively and negatively charged. So the, um, the little pieces of iron like slowly stick to the copper. So it creates this really separation between the copper and, and the paper. So it's easier to use color, it's easier to wipe, and also, um, if this is a fairly delicate process, I would get a very low addition. If I did this um, without steel facing, I don't know, it might get 
30 or 40, but if I steel face it, I can go much, much higher in the addition number because it makes it stronger. So it's a way of reinforcing uh, the design. So, did that answer your question? So, so this is actually, you can see that it's copper, but it's steel face. And this, um, it's also really prone to rust. Um, some of this is rust and some of this is just the, the iron wearing away and the copper start striking back through. So you can remove this just by dipping it in a solution of nitric acid and then rinsing it off, and then you can start the process again. Um, yeah, you don't lose it. Yeah, you don't lose it. So. You do you have your own baths for that, too? I, I don't, unfortunately. I, I helped to build one because they're fairly simple. Um, but at this point, the options are you can mail them to a company in Brooklyn and they wait for you and ship them out. Can you explain how you did that? Like, and then how you did the color. Yes, I'd be happy to. That's some. a really great example of, of 50 ways to print something. There's also a print here you can see variations from a relief print to etching to full color uh, viscosity. So you can you can print a plate in an infinite number of ways. So both images came from this plate. This is a shinkolet. This is just black ink. And the paper is an okawara, an okawara Japanese paper. And you ink the plate, you lay the, uh, the paper on the back of the, or on the front of the ink surface, then you put um, a glue sizing, right? a liquid glue sizing, it's a rice glue. And then you put your cover sheet on top of that and run it through the press. And it, it, it um, laminates the, the okawara to the white paper, but also you get the effect of the color See that soft yellow as well. And also, um, depending on what kind of paper, it's very, very, very thin. It's much thinner, much more supple than cotton. So it picks up every nuance. Like, so Shinkale, um, you can get very, very, very delicate effects in Shinkale. So that's how this one, Shinkale on Okawara. This one is called Ala Pupe. And um, Ala Pupe means little doll's head in France, in French. And it means literally like, has anybody ever made puppets or dolls where you take a cloth and you put cotton in the center and you tie it around the edge and that's the head? Does anybody do that anymore? <laughs> so our kids made those, right? I thought, maybe, maybe you imagine they made maybe. them. So anyway, so you make all these little dolls' heads and uh, they effectually are like paintbrushes. And so each of these colors are hand applied to the area of the plate. And this, this took me six tries to get this one. Because um, it's really dependent on the harmonics, how one color bleeds into the other. So it's, um, and you can't see it, you can only see it somewhat. Um, but because you're, you're working on copper and you can't really tell the subtleties of the color and so on, you really just, it's chance, so all it's chance. Um, and it has to be, to me, like for this, what makes this a painterly print is it has a harmonic. I really, really don't like prints that are hand colored where they have the, the red cow and the green field with the blue sky. You know, it's totally, it totally has nothing to do with luminosity. So this, my interest in this is that it acts more like prismatic light than, than color. I'm not interested in color, I'm interested in light. I mean, I'm interested in color, but in that kind of idiom, is that right? Idiom? If you look at the plate of your three different colors, can you see it better? I mean, different, just different illuminations. Um, the darker colors are easy to see. Um, like this is how you can see, the, see what you did. Get a chance to get there. Yeah, it's hard because the colors are transparent, just like that sanguine that I printed with a D. It's transparent. It's really, really thin. And then this, um, this is an alizarin pink, and I didn't want it to look pink, so I, I had to almost wipe it completely off. So that was really hard to tell whether I really actually totally destroyed the, the alizarin crimson or there's still a veil. So um, there's there's still just enough there that it crosses over. So this actually moves in, you see it's a red violet, then it goes blue violet, then it goes blue. Um, that's, that's what I'm going for, It's kind of the suffusion. So thank you for that question, that was a good question. Yeah. Anything else? Can you use that again? Yes, or? yes, no. yes. Like, how did you get the color? Is there a special solvent that you mm -hmm. used to get all that ink off of? I mean, um, that color off? Or? Well, actually, yeah. We're right. What I do if I'm going to print on it, like if I'm going to, you, you hand color it, then you print it, then you have to clean it before you print it or ink it again. Oh, okay. So I'll just take denatured alcohol and I'll wipe it down because that evaporates very quickly. Um, so I'm putting it away for, for the night. I use a, um, a soy-based solvent and that's more aggressive and it gets all of the ink out of the lines. 
and then I'll use soap and water like detergent. Joy is actually the best. I don't yeah. can't imagine washing dishes with joy. It's like soap. It melts with the oil. It's very, very strong. It's great for printmaking. It's more efficient. It's good. Yeah. So any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.